Hey, what's up guys? My name is Sal and this is another Expedition Log. In this episode, we're headed 10 stops northwest of Union Station on the DC Metro's Red Line to a property that was once the beacon of high fashion. In the span of just a few months, this bougie mall went from a healthy footprint with luxury anchors down to just a TJ Maxx as its sole tenant down in the basement. As always, I hope you and yours are having a good time all the time, staying happy and healthy out there. Also, less than 10% of my total views come from people actually subscribed to me. So if you're new to my channel, welcome. I really hope that you enjoy my work. If you've been with me for a while now, or even just a few episodes, I kindly ask that you subscribe and ring the bell for all notifications. It would mean the world to me. But today, I'd like you to come take a walk with me through Maza Gallery in the Friendship Heights neighborhood of Washington, D.C. to see just how far this gorgeous property has fallen, directly in the face of high fashion. But first, a word from our sponsor, a fashion show. Enjoy. Freestyle beard portion of our contest. to the beautiful Friendship Heights. This Washington DC neighborhood shares a border with Maryland and directly across Western Avenue, which is right to the north of us right now, is Chevy Chase, Maryland, with an average household income well above $250,000 per year. Chevy Chase was once named the most affluent city in the United States, but has recently been dethroned by Silicon Valley. There's so much money in this area and it should come as no surprise that in the span of just a couple of blocks, you've got Lord & Taylor and Bloomingdale's, along with white glove retailers like Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus, Tiffany & Company, and Louis Vuitton. As long as I can remember, the Wisconsin Avenue shopping district was always way above my pay grade. As a student, I'd eat lunch in my car around here before playing my violin at nearby gigs. This area always just felt pretentious and superficial. Everything is expensive, just for the sake of being expensive, so why would a pedestrian such as myself set foot in the mall here? 
Well, now with a renewed perspective on retail as a whole, I came back to see how this area was doing, and I was absolutely floored with what I saw inside and out. In 1950, Woodward and Lothrop opened a new department store on the northwest corner of Wisconsin and Western Avenues, which would mark the beginning of the retail expansion through the Friendship Heights and Chevy Chase area. By 1964, three important additions would come to the neighborhood to propel its success. The Barlow Building was erected, bringing the first high-rise to the area. And then came the 400-unit apartment building called the Highland House, followed by the opening of a brand new flagship Saks Fifth Avenue, just a few blocks north of where we are right now. The area was expanding at an incredible pace, and by the early 1970s, plans were announced to bring a formal enclosed shopping mall to this neighborhood. As a matter of fact, the entire DC metro area was being exponentially built out as a whole, and its underground metro, which first opened for service in 1976, would soon have a direct line to the Friendship Heights neighborhood, and in time would serve as the front door to a shiny new enclosed mall. This shiny new enclosed mall was meant to be under construction by 1973, but would face construction delays, union strikes, and complexities surrounding the future adoption of a metro stop in its basement. Enter Olga Maza, executor of the estate that owned the land on which the mall would be built, and matriarch of the Maza family. Olga was the daughter to Louise Maza, and when Louise Maza passed away, she bequeathed the land that this mall was to be built on to Olga, and Olga decided to name the mall after her late mother, Louise. A bit later in this episode, you'll see a portrait of Louise hanging up in the main concourse, so keep an eye out for that. Olga and John W. Ridnor III, along with two other Washington area investors, partnered with Exxon's Houston-based real estate division to fund the construction of the property, and their joint entity would be called HSL DC Inc. And you know what? When you step back and you look at this whole thing from a pretty high altitude, it all makes perfect sense. Olga Maza needed a robust anchor tenant to really sell this space to her investors. She chose Neiman Marcus, or possibly Neiman Marcus caught wind of this and wanted to expand east, but the two came together. And given their affinity for the big oil money that probably made Neiman Marcus rich in the first place, it comes as no surprise that Exxon became the largest stakeholder in the entire development for this mall. Construction finally began in 1975, and after about a year and a half of work, the $25 million Maza Gallery had its grand opening on November 7th, 1977. The enclosed mall featured a four-floor concourse, showcasing a 120,000 square foot Neiman Marcus department store. The Maza Exxon partnership allowed Neiman Marcus to bring in their own architect to design the department store and the surrounding structure. The architectural firm of John Carl Warnicke decided on a bold design that would flaunt expansive use of marble on the exterior with virtually non-existent fenestration around the building, which would force the use of artificial lighting in the main concourse. Some liken the design to be reminiscent of a mausoleum, and I happen to agree with them. While a healthy amount of malls built in this time would have out parcels like an auto center, photo development kiosk, a key maker, a restaurant, or maybe a bank, Maza Gallery had an existing Woodward and Lothrop and a Lord and Taylor directly across the street and parking lot to accompany the new mall. But Neiman Marcus, the mecca of Texas millionaires, wanted a grand statement on the East Coast, and they knew that just their name alone would be enough to draw in big money as it had been doing for the 70 years leading up to their expansion to the DC market. It was a display of unwavering bravado that would ultimately hurt Maza Gallery through the years. For decades, Neiman Marcus catered to a clientele that wouldn't think twice about dropping $130,000 on a floor-length Russian Lynx coat. Others would pop in casually to be fitted for a $10,000 Dior gown, or to pick up a $250,000 set of ruby and diamond jewelry. The Texas market was inundated with big money from oil, and Stanley Marcus adapted through the years to sell these people exactly what they needed to brag at their next outing or dinner party. 
Marcus would begin by lying to the press when they jokingly asked, what's the most unusual things that are going to be sold this holiday season? But Mr. Marcus wanted to go big and decided to actually start selling these crazy things out of a catalog, which would ultimately usher in the big dream genre of mail-in malls. For $588,247, you could actually purchase a Noah's Ark with space for eight passengers, a crew of four, and 180 different species of wildlife. Maybe you wanted to buy a personal submarine. Sure, that'll cost you $50,000 and it'll be shipped right to your house. You could buy a camel for just over $4,000 if you really wanted to. Texans went big and Neiman Marcus adapted their business model to accommodate their Midwest clientele. But would this model really translate to the conservative society of Washington, D.C.'s federal establishment? Could this big Texan department store actually rely on the Midwest reputation and name Neiman Marcus alone? It was a big gamble to plop down an unchiseled block of marble in the middle of D.C., which was already overflowing with neoclassical architecture. And when I say unchiseled block of marble, that's exactly what it resembled. A big giant block of marble with no windows. If you've followed my series for a while, you've undoubtedly seen the lexicon of Jim Rouse's work, which features malls that flaunt the use of clerestory windows and skylights to maximize efficiency in both natural lighting and the exchange of heat in and out of the building. Windows are a point of economy for many developers. Natural light can help save on electricity while allowing the radiant light through to heat the building, lowering costs of air conditioning. There's a certain humility about the modest architectural language seen in malls by developers such as Rouse, DeBartolo, Taubman, or Gruen. They had their moments, and they embellished and made a couple of flourishes here and there, but their overall modesty created a welcoming environment for everyone, all walks of life. And I can't help but thinking that that was intentional. But here, at Maza Gallery, the portrayed image meant to intimidate someone away from venturing into the main concourse who actually had to ask how much something cost. It was about controlling every aspect of the experience 100% of the time for both the consumer and the press. Lighting could never change unless management wanted it to change and the climate must be accurate within one-tenth of a degree or else someone was going to get fired. Stray lighting could ruin the aesthetic experience for a display that a visual merchandiser spent days planning, designing, and crafting. The temperature should be higher in the outerwear department to really sell the efficacy of those awful fur coats. And if you hoped to sell an expensive cowboy hat, partner, you best make sure that that lighting really simulates a Texas sunset just right. While Neiman Marcus dominated the upper levels of Maza Gallery, the elitism would continue as you made your way into the basement concourse. At grand opening, basement tenants included Raleigh's Haberdasher, acting as junior anchor, along with a Foot Locker, Record Town, and an upscale McDonald's, among others. And then there was Harriet Cassman. Harriet Cassman opened a self-named boutique which would further augment the vision of Maza Gallery as a beacon of high fashion in the D.C. metro area. Miss Kassman would show up to her luxurious clothing store every day in high heels decked out in makeup and the best clothes, along with her petite poodle named Bastien. Her vision was to give the local elite a taste of what a private European buying experience might be without actually taking them to Europe. She would take her own buying trips to Europe to fill her shop with designer fashions that otherwise couldn't be easily acquired in the United States at the time, selling these things at an incredible premium. In the 1970s and 80s, having a small shop filled with European garments of Christian Lacroix, Sonia Riquel, and Giorgio Armani was considered to be exotic and elite. It was this elitist ethos that Maza Gallery would continue building on through the years, accepting nothing less than positioning itself as the second coming of New York's Fifth Avenue, or Rodeo Drive, in Beverly Hills.
At this point in time, the new mall could have gone one of two ways. Either it would change the face of the community, providing a much sought after boutique for high fashion to a wealthy demographic that desperately wanted to spend all of their money on these things. Telling their friends at parties to come buy things at this mall and telling their family and having their friends and family all come and spend tons of money at this place. Or the mall would simply paint the image of success and haute couture, failing to retain tenants and never quite reaching the heights of success seen in the wealthy Texas regions that Neiman Marcus was so sure they could find out east. Well, just one year after the mall opened, on December 23rd, 1978, the Washington Post published an article titled, quote, Problems at Maza Gallery, close quote. Good evening, Mrs. Maza. Thanks so much for the mall. You rock. Author Jerry Knight would go on to speculate that the mall was already in talks to be sold, painting the mall to be failing just one year into its life. The Neiman Marcus only had two stores open at its side, and the mall was sitting at around 20% vacancy. I have found this to be pretty normal in new malls, while they're in the shakedown period of courting new tenants in full occupancy would often take about a year or so. But this mall wasn't seeing much traffic, which may have been due to the ongoing construction for the DC Metro Friendship Heights Red Line stop, which would connect directly to Maza Gallery's basement. During construction, the road was closed off, and there was only one way into the mall, which was most certainly inconvenient for the high-class folks of this region. But despite this tiny hiccup, parking was plentiful, and there was no reason anyone couldn't visit. I feel compelled to break the historical narrative at this point to address the current state of this Saks Fifth Avenue men's store, because it's pretty weird to see boards up on the inside of a mall. On October 23rd, 2020, Karan Hilton Brown was killed while police were in pursuit, and following this tragedy, there were peaceful protests that erupted across the city. But unfortunately, at this location and many others, those peaceful protests did turn violent, and I would just like to say that that's not okay. No matter what your political affiliation, no matter what you're protesting, it's never okay for these things to turn violent. And while my thoughts are with the family of Karan Hilton Brown, please don't resort to violence. It's really not a good look. But that's what happened here. Rioters broke through the windows, and the owners had no choice but to board it up. Dismissing complaints by mall merchants that sales have been disappointing, Foster Shannon, who was president of Shannon & Lux, the real estate firm handling leasing and management for Maz Gallery, simply dismissed the complaints saying, quote, all retail sales are off everywhere, close quote. Now, remember, this mall was catering to the ultra rich with stores that often had very little merchandise on their sales floors due to the astronomical prices and handcrafted quality. Yet, they were complaining about low traffic. The picture starts to take focus from this point, and it becomes clear what the trajectory for Maza Gallery would be if nothing were to change. Oops. Have a good night. Through the 1980s, more reports would surface that the mall was failing to garner the level of success that most expected of it. Despite the DC Metro Friendship Heights Red Line stop being finished in 1983, sales were disappointing through the first decade of the boutique mall's life. The 90s were no different, and most thought of the big slab of marble as a failure. Then the mall finally went up for sale in the mid-90s, and the owners were asking for nearly $60 million. The property sat on the market for a while, and was dubbed the Mammoth Marble Failure. The price was adjusted multiple times, and the mall was finally sold to Daniel McCaffrey in June of 1997 for 28 million bucks, which was more than 50% lower than the asking price. Mr. McCaffrey was working on behalf of the Canadian-based Oxford Development Group, and the acquisition was funded by the City Center Retail Trust, which was controlled by Santa Fe, New Mexico-based Security Capital Group. Daniel McCaffrey immediately announced a sweeping $30 million renovation that would come to Maza Gallery, and work commenced in the months following the sale. He chose not to renew the lease for most inline tenants, and closed most of the mall for nearly three years while the renovations continued. The mall reopened in phases, with an initial grand rededication and ribbon cutting on November 4th, 1999, 
where 500 guests celebrated the event with an evening gala. More stores would open in the coming months, with the General Cinemas opening in December 1999, and a new 22,000 square foot Saks Fifth Avenue men's store opening in the spring of 2000. Overall, the renovations cost in excess of $30 million, just a bit more than was spent actually purchasing the property. But the changes brought to Mazda Gallery were necessary and successfully corrected most of the egregious flaws of the original design. New entranceways were added throughout the structure, along with gorgeous hardwood floors, upgraded lighting throughout, and new seating areas for shoppers, which I actually didn't see while I was here. The escalators were realigned and some carpeting was added too. But most notably, Mr. McGaffrey broke through the walls of the marble fortress to install massive windows with incredibly large glass panes around the building. Natural lighting could finally penetrate this mall, and local shoppers had incredibly positive comments about the newly installed windows and overall layout and visual appeal of this huge renovation. With these changes came new tenants and a fresh energy to the mall that positioned it among the more high-end shopping centers in the DC metro area, giving it a fighting chance to confidently step into the new millennium. The general cinema chain was bought out by AMC Theaters in February 2002, rebranding all locations, including the one at Mazda Gallery. Into the mid-2000s, the elitist atmosphere at Mazda had been toned back somewhat, and among the remaining high-end offerings, such as Neiman Marcus, Saks, and Williams Sonoma, one could shop at this mall and find discounts at places like Filene's Basement and Lomans. The place was doing great. The property's tax valuation had gone up to $62.6 million, and Daniel McCaffrey decided it was time to move on after doing such fantastic work to get the mall back up on its feet. At this time, Oxford Development Group had become Brookfield Properties. Brookfield would go on to acquire a few malls that I've covered in my series, such as the Mondawmin Mall, the Mall in Columbia, Towson Town Center, and the White Marsh Mall. Now that this mall had garnered success and profit though, GE Capital, who bought out the Security Capital Group in a $4 billion deal in 2001, they put the mall up for sale. On Memorial Day weekend of 2004, Mazda Gallery was sold for $76.5 million to the New York-based Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association. Let's just call them TIAA for short. TIAA manages pension assets for several thousand investors in education, and at the time they had a total real estate portfolio worth over $50 billion. So this was just a drop in the bucket for them. The Friendship Heights neighborhood was beginning to truly blossom as an archetype of high fashion by 2006. At the time, Wisconsin Place was being developed directly across Western Avenue from Mazda Gallery, where the Woodies once stood, turned hects, and was then being converted into a Bloomingdale's, surrounded by an open-air layout of shops to draw people into that environment. This was also around when the Chevy Chase Center was built, acting as the central hub for Friendship Heights. Across Wisconsin Avenue from Mazda was the Chevy Chase Pavilion, which was doing quite well in its teenage years, with a World Market, J. Crew, and Pottery Barn bringing shoppers in. Mazda Gallery was about to undergo some renovations also, with a $5 million project aimed at updating some features, including a new paint job, turning the recessed windows into protruding box windows, updating the metro station entrance with a new curved canopy, and installing a three-story arched glass display with dozens of glass butterflies, which would reflect the spectrum of light through prisms, creating a different show of color every day. Hmm. Did either of them release? This just came out on HBO. That's... Delayed. The renovations were completed by Thanksgiving of that year. It was around the late 2000s that I would start venturing through the Friendship Heights and Chevy Chase areas to play in the violin section of local orchestras and doing some wedding gigs here and there on the weekends in the area. Mazda Gallery would see the departure of Miss Harriet Kassman when she closed her boutique in 2009. Miss Kassman would die at the age of 90 just three years later. As we got into the 2010s, Friendship Heights would welcome insurance conglomerate GEICO in their new corporate headquarters, which comprised about 800,000 square feet of space and brought an incredible amount of jobs to the area. 
With the added foot traffic directly in Friendship Heights, retail was booming and the area was thriving. Well, everyone was doing great except Filene's basement, which was in the middle of bankruptcy proceedings and ultimately wound up closing the chain by 2011. The empty store would sit vacant for two years and in August 2013, TJ Maxx would open in its place here at Mazza Gallery, further expanding their selection towards more budget-oriented shoppers. The TIAA put them all up for sale as it was enjoying a huge upswing in success. And after just a short time on the market, Ben Ashkenazi purchased Mazza Gallery for $78 million in January of 2017. We last spoke of Mr. Ashkenazi in Xlog 86, which covered Union Station in DC, which is in his portfolio. If you haven't yet seen this episode, you definitely want to check it out after this one. It's pretty great. Mazza Gallery was in good hands with its new owner and coasting on a string of success. But as we all know, things would come crashing down to a standstill a few years later. It was dark, and there was fog in the air. A cold January morning, but rainy. That kind of rain that would have been snow had it just been a few degrees colder. Everything was quiet, and everyone was in their homes resting peacefully, hiding in their blankets from the wet, cold morning. The sun wouldn't show itself for about another hour. It was that time in the morning where you might wake up naturally, but then realize you had an extra hour or three of sleep before anyone required anything of you. You wake up and look outside, then at your clock. After a good stretch and a yawn, your head hits the pillow, which is cold again since you turned it over after waking up, and sleep comes almost instantly. But then, a gentle voice calls out to you from the silence. And if you listen very carefully, you can just make out the faint whisper of a voice in the shadows. Mazza Gallery, like all other malls around the country, closed due to COVID-19 at its peak. When this place finally opened back up, most of the tenants wouldn't come back, and the high-end retailers would find themselves nearly broke too. In August of 2020, both Lord & Taylor and Neiman Marcus would file for bankruptcy protection. The stores in the Friendship Heights area would shudder as a result, leaving Mazza Gallery with TJ Maxx as its one and only tenant, while the AMC Theater remained closed with its future up in the air and they were still figuring their life out, not sure when people could actually get back to the movies. To make matters worse, Ashkenazi had defaulted on the $67.1 million loan used to acquire this mall. And this place was headed to a foreclosure auction on Friday, August 28th. The auction kicked off that Friday morning outside the DC office of Alex Cooper Auctioneers with a crowd of about a dozen socially distanced onlookers. With only a slight back and forth, the winning bid came in at $38 million from publicly traded New York-based Annaly Capital Management. I showed up to film this place three months after it was sold to Annaly to find it in the condition that you just saw. Then, two months after my visit, AMC finally announced that its seven-screen theater at Mazza Gallery would permanently shutter. 
thereby bringing the occupancy at this mall below 5%. By the way, if you'd like to see a more extensive tour of the inside of this closing Lord & Taylor, I will be posting the raw footage up to my second channel, named Quite Studios, at some point in the next week or so. No, not open. So make sure to go sub to my second channel. There's a link in my description, and you can find it by searching for Quite Studios. So if you're into raw content, I do a lot of that on my second channel. I'm fairly certain that Annaly Capital will sell this property when market conditions improve. They're not into buying and redeveloping malls, so the future for Mazza Gallery right now is pretty uncertain. There's no public plans to do anything with this space yet, and no key management positioned to bring them all back to its former glory. It's just gonna sit here looking beautiful until somebody decides to make something of it. Only time will tell what happens with this space. I'd like to thank all of you for watching my video. This mall was an absolute treat to film, especially since I had avoided stepping foot in here for so many years. I never knew what it looked like inside this place, except for a couple of pictures that I saw randomly on the internet. So I'm glad to have been able to share this with all of you, as both my first time seeing it and your first time taking a walk with me through it. Speaking of which, if you're still here watching this right now, it must mean that you dig at least something about my content. If that happens to be true, you may as well just hit the subscribe button and enable all notifications by pressing the bell. You probably want to know when I release new films, and doing those two things are the only way to coerce YouTube into notifying you of my existence. I would appreciate it, and I would be humbled if you were to subscribe and ring the bell. Thanks especially to my patrons and elite explorers who support me directly and enable me to take trips off the beaten path that I normally wouldn't have done. Now that I'm double vaxxed and things are starting to return to normal, you can expect me to take the X-Log farther and wider, and there are some absolutely incredible voyages coming up. So please, stay tuned to all of my social media for updates and behind-the-scenes looks, and if you want to follow me between my expeditions. Links to everything are down below, including the Dead Malls of Discord server. Dmod is an awesome place to hang out, and we have lots of fun there, so please do join if you want to chat with me and others live. Just download the Discord app on your phone, tablet, or computer, make your account, and click the link in my description. It's all free, and it's all super easy to set up. I'll be back soon with Xlog88, where we go directly across the street from here to the Chevy Chase Pavilion, before heading up north, possibly totally passing right by Baltimore. You don't want to miss what's coming up next on my channel. But until then, please stay safe out there, everyone. Take care of yourselves, and have a fantastic day.